Japanese war crime titles. You'll see both inside of history, but make sure you understand both. You also need to write down a man's name called Hideki Tojo. Tojo was the, pro the minister of war. He's the guy largely responsible for manipulating the Japanese government into fighting the war and continuing to fight against America in the Pacific. He believed that he could defeat the Americans if they struck at Pearl Harbor. Tojo um, himself is also, like Gary, going to try to commit suicide before his, his, his sentence gets handed down to him. Um, however, they revive him, they resuscitate him through, through CPR and other means and bring him back to life, and then they execute him about four weeks later, okay? So they actually bring the guy back to life after he tried to kill himself, and then they killed him themselves because they wanted, to, they wanted the justice that they were seeking out against him. One thing I'd like you to understand about this piece in Japan is that the emperor is allowed to stay in charge of the country. They don't overthrow the emperor, but they made somewhat of a deal up with the emperor. They said, you have to renounce yourself and say to your people that you're not a god. People in Japan believed that their emperor was almost godlike, like he was a, he was a prophet, somebody who, could, uh, who uh, was divine and, and had spiritual connections to another realm or another world. And they told him, you can stay as emperor, Hirohito, but you cannot let your people believe that you're a god. You have to represent yourself as a human. And then we do the same thing we did in Germany. We stay with Japan, we help them rebuild, we teach them a process of quality control, we teach them how to rebuild their country and come back as a powerful country too. It's funny to think about how two of the countries we have destroyed the most in any war ever inside of history are Japan and Germany, and two of our biggest allies in the world in this year is Japan and Germany. They have essentially become Two countries that support the United States, they trade with us, they're very active with us, they have military, we have military bases there still to today, and we have soldiers who are there, not for the reasons of World War II, but because the, of the bases we have there. Seven future presidents come out of World War II. Can you name them? Give me one. Eisenhower. JFK. Ford. Nixon. Obama. <laughs> Carter. Okay. Reagan. George Bush Sr. That should be all seven by now. All those presidents come out. So when you look at American foreign policy and you think about America, do you think these guys maybe just had a little bit to do with, or a little bit of influence from World War II that maybe carried over into how they influenced our country? Absolutely, they played a huge role inside of our country. We're talking um, decades of influence from people who have participated in World War II. We're going to lead to a time period in the, in the Cold War called the Space Race. The Space Race is a significant thing that's going to eventually lead to our moon landing. This again relates to the Cold War, to us competing with the USSR and to the tensions that are leading between the two major superpowers to compete for something but not necessarily fight each other. We're fighting each other in different ways. Computers come out of World War II. Some of the largest computers you've probably ever seen because you guys are holding them in your hands. Some of the people who helped create these are dead now and if they saw the ones you were holding, they'd be absolutely amazed. Those are the computers you're looking at right there. Whether you're looking at the Mark I or the Colossus inside of 1941, those computers themselves took up entire rooms and they did very basic, basic things as far as computation. What you hold in your hand as a smartphone has come light years from 1940 with the first computers really coming out of World War II. Um, this should be, I got two last slides next, okay? There's a couple people and a couple events that we're gonna be talking about in, in the future that are gonna come up. You can write this one down first. India's independence movement with Gandhi and Jinnah. That's India's independence movement on the left here. There's gonna be a conflict inside of Vietnam. The various conflicts in the Middle East with Yasser Arafat, you might remember that picture in the top right up here. The Mau Mau is a, uh, is a tribal group inside of Africa that gets absolutely devastated by the British when they try and take back the colony after World War II. And then down here in the bottom is a man named Fidel Castro, who's the Cuban leader who allies himself with the USSR. We have a lot of what we call third world movements. After World War II, countries that were controlled by other countries and all the imperialism and all the nationalism we talked about in World War I, guys, they don't want to be controlled anymore. These nationalist movements are going to rebel against their governments, rebel against the countries that control them. That would lead you to this world map. 
These are the countries that were colonies prior to World War II. And these are the countries that are going to seek to control themselves and hold independence movements to overthrow their governments. This leads us into the next unit of world history and what we'll be doing in the last nine weeks inside of Global Studies, guys. We'll be talking about these different regions. Largely, the colonies that were, that the biggest amount of colonies in the world were inside of Africa, okay? Africa was highly, highly colonized. So a term I want you to look up and I paste the definition in for is right at the top. It's decolonization. Another huge period of the Cold War is decolonizing countries that no longer want to be occupied by countries who controlled them in World War II and during that time period. After you finish writing that, you can close your computer. Make sure you catch the beginning of this. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80-year-old today was 10 when World War II ended, four when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors before this connection of memory is lost. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're gonna tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men, the average age was about 23. In most battles, for every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than 1,000 who are injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries, and anything else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths, and we'll begin with American soldiers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. The war began on September 1st, 1939, but the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. So about the same number of U.S. soldiers died on this single beach land as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. The bloodiest battle in the Pacific was Okinawa, which lasted 82 days, during which 12,500 Americans died. About 5,000 of these deaths were at sea from kamikaze attacks. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. 
The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France, over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fights. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. The initial invasion brought relatively few casualties on both sides, but the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. The Nazi invasions were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded, but took the fight to the Nazis. Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the US, which includes the British colonies. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the US and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, which took place in France and Belgium. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front. Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of the European War, was Stalingrad. The German Sixth Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. When you include these POWs, roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. But winning the war came at a cost. Seven million is the official tally by the Russian military, a hotly disputed number. Some studies have calculated as many as 14 million dead. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts, including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military deaths on the timeline, it looks like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. And now we switch to civilian deaths in Europe. Six million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. If you separate this by country, you see that about half, 2.7 million, were Polish. 700,000 were Soviets, followed by Hungary and 17 other countries. Broken down another way, about half of the six million were killed in the concentration camps. Over a million died in Auschwitz. Most were killed in the gas chambers. Others died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, and other forms of execution. The second most deadly camp was Treblinka, which was exclusively an extermination camp, set up to look like a train station. Mobile killing groups killed 1.4 million Jews.
Like with the gas chambers, men were killed first to reduce the risk of revolt. The Holocaust also includes non-Jewish deaths. Between 130,000 to 500,000 Roma, then called gypsies, were killed. The numbers are disputed. About a quarter million people with disabilities were killed. Homosexuals, Catholics, and other groups were also exterminated, but their numbers were relatively small. Some historians say that other civilian deaths should go under the label of Holocaust. About two million non-Jewish Poles were killed under German occupation. Some of it were sent to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. When you combine civilian and military deaths, over 16% of the total Polish population died in World War II, which is the highest percentage of any country. But not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers, somewhere between 10 and 20 million. A particularly dark moment for the Soviet Union was the siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. German forces surrounded Leningrad before civilians could be evacuated. Supplies, including food, were cut off for two and a half years. One and a half million people died as a result, mostly from starvation, mostly civilians. Stalin's cruelty towards his own people is partly responsible for these numbers. He often didn't allow civilians to evacuate from cities, thinking it would cause the soldiers protecting them to fight harder. About a million Soviets died in Stalin's own labor camps, called the Gulag. Just about every country suffered civilian losses, especially countries who were invaded. While many died as a result of so-called collateral damage, the biggest numbers occurred when it was no accident. Civilians were exterminated, purposely fired upon or bombed, used as human shields, or intentionally deprived of food. The intentional killing of civilians was done by most of the war.